God. Let's pray this morning. Let's pray today, this morning. Do you want the Lord to speak to you today? Not many of them. Do you want the Lord to speak to us today? Let's pray and ask the God Almighty, your Creator, your Redeemer, through His Word, to speak to our hearts today. Let's pray, church. Let's pray for us. Heavenly Father, we don't want to hear the voice of a man today, Lord, but the earnest and desire to hear from you, Lord. And my God, I can speak nothing, my God, for you, Lord, without the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord. I have no confidence in the man. I have no confidence in this blessed man today, but I have full confidence in you, Lord. Your word is perfect. Your word is true. I pray that you take your word, my God, and my God, just bring it, my God, out of my mouth today, how you want to preach me. God, I pray that you take captive our hearts, captive our minds, and captive our thoughts, my God. Lord, that you can speak to our lives, my God, so our lives can be challenged and changed and reformed and renewed, my God, through the sovereign work of your Holy Spirit today, Lord. In the name of Jesus. If you've got a Bible, I'll give you a second to turn, turn to Psalms 23. Most of us can recite Psalms 23, and most of us would probably say today, well, I don't even need to open the Bible. But the Word of God, it's not about what we heard yesterday, last week, last month. It's alive today. Would you agree with that? And you know, as we go before the Lord in prayer, and as we ask God for direction, you know what God leads us and guides us sometimes, and we sort of question on our own. Psalms 23, Lord, and you could have, have probably maybe say it yourself, you know, message here, message for the seminar, it's Sunday school stuff, maybe some people would say, Psalms 23, it's Sunday school stuff, we've learned it from being in Sunday school. You know, when we really look at the in-depth part of the writer of Psalms 23, I wish I could go back to Sunday school. I really mean that. And as much as we need to know the Greek, we really do. When we need to know the Hebrew, and we really need to know the interpretation of the scriptures. But some days within our life, and some days when I look at the church and look at the people of God, I wish you know we could really go back to the basics of God's word, believe what it says, apply it to our lives, and live it out for Jesus. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He, the Lord, makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He, the Lord, restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, Lord, prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You, Lord, anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. What a way to finish a, a text for the Lord, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Use at home, back in your own churches, where I've heard many good messages preached, Bible studies, Sunday morning sermons, about, uh, preached upon Psalms 23. And probably a lot better than what I'm going to be able to preach today, but in an in-depth Bible study, you'll, 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 have, you'll have heard studies on, you know, how God uh, refers to his children as sheep. As, you know, he looks down upon his children, you'll have heard great messages about sheep being dumb animals, and sheep often going astray and you'll have also heard great uh, sermons and bible studies about the shepherd king david who would know from a young boy a young as a young age that god called him out of all the all the, the, the boys of, of his family uh, his father jesse he was the one who was least to be chosen and we, you, you learn how he became from a young shepherd boy into a great king and 
and led God's people. Great Bible studies, and I, I have respect for many who have heard preach upon Psalms 23. But when I look today, and, and we have to have a word what is going to apply to our lives, it's going to make any difference, application for our lives today. You can, if you really look into the Word of God, you can really see the heart of David. You can really see the heart of David. He's, he's referring himself to a sheep rather than a shepherd. Do you see that? When he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd, he's putting himself into the category of a sheep, isn't he? Because the shepherd is someone who takes care of the sheep. So we see David's heart here. Now, we know he was a man of great importance. David was a man of great importance out of all the people that God could have chosen. He chose him to be the leader of God's people. You know, we know that he was a, a man of great power. David was a man of great power. He was a man of great wealth. He was a man of the finest of places, the best of things. He, he was a man of, you know, if you look at the breeding of King David, King David had the, the finest of breeding, couldn't get any better. He was actually, you know, he was the one who was going to come down and it would be the lineage of Jesus. So the finest of breeding, the finest of everything. David was surrounded with the finest of everything. But what I love about David's heart in Psalms 23, he pushes everything of himself aside and he starts to look and gaze upon God for who his God is. His God is to him. You know, he, he, he starts to push, push the pride aside, push the stature aside, humbling himself before God. James just quoted that. You know, John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that God can increase. David, he had to, to as he's pouring his heart out to God, and we've got it. We've got Psalms 23 to treasure today. As men who are look today, some men in here, maybe not in the standards of, of you know, leaders of, of the nation of Israel, but men, I'm talking about men, not just in ministry. God has called you to lead his people. God has called you to lead others to Christ. We have men of great stature, we have men of great importance, we have men of great wealth. And I'm, I'm not against none of that. But what I love about the application we can take from King David here, or just let's call him David, the young shepherd boy, he is starting to decrease and he is exalting and, and you know, adoring the name of his God. I see someone here, instead of, you know, being speaking about who he was or who he could be, he was a man, and the Bible speaks about David of being after a man after God's own heart. And we look and you speak, look about the man, how, how can such a man be after God's own heart? Because he was now in a place where he was desiring to know the heart of God. And you can see it's intimate. This is a one-on-one. -on -one. This is a one-on-one -on -one experience where a man is humbling himself before his almighty God and he's starting to see the plan and the path that God has for his, his life. The Lord, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. David was surrounded by good people. You know, but what I love here, it doesn't say, you know, my father is Jesse, so I won't be in want. My pastor or my prophet or my leader, King Saul, is my, is my king. Or, or, you know, the prophet Samuel is, is my teacher. So therefore, I won't be in want. He's pushing all of the flesh out so that he can focus and fix his mind upon the Lord who is his shepherd. And you know who that Lord is today? The Lord Jehovah. The Lord who is self-sufficient. The Lord who is self-existent. The Lord who is all-powerful and all-knowing. And this David now is needing, you can see it within his mind, he's, he's needing to, to feel the hand of God reaching his hand out, Lord, would you lead me? Because I'm not capable of leading myself. Lord, would you speak to me? Because this mind is unfruitful and I'm not capable of leading myself. To feel the comfort, to feel the, the voice, to, to know that his life is in Jehovah's hands. 
is starting to really, really value. I want to ask you a question today. Brothers, and we're in this work together. There is not a man who is exempt from checking himself and looking at his own life. Is God, the Jehovah, the Good Shepherd of King David, the same God who is leading you? And we check ourselves on the Word of God. He's now, you know, he's looking at the Lord, Jehovah. Remember the stories about Peter, another man of, who lived a turbulent life. The time when he really recognized who God was in his life, who God was. And he, he jumped off the boat, didn't he? He said, Lord, he said, I'm not worthy. As if to say, Lord, I'm not even worthy to speak your name. And the time when Jesus had died and, and been rose back to life and, and he was on the shore to see Galilee. And you know, he said, it's the Lord. You know the word Lord. Is, is God your Lord today? Is he really your Lord? Because you know the word Lord in its context. There is only one context. What we can put, who is Jehovah God? He is our Lord, He is our owner, He is our master, He is our shepherd, and He is everything you and me need as a child of the living God. David, instead of looking at what he's been or what he could be, he now starts to look at who God is in his life. You know the story about King David. We heard a little bit about him early on. Uh, our brother uh, Charles shared a little bit about King David. He lived quite a turbulent life, hadn't he, in his, in his walk with God. Before he, got, before he got called by God, he was just a, a lovely, fine young man, you know, servant, his father, living life and living it to the full in the flesh. But when he got called by God, his life took dramatic changes. He lived, he lived a turbulent life. His, his life was a roller coaster. Would, you would say that, wouldn't you? You know, one minute he's the hero. He's, you know, he's, he's killed Goliath with one stone. These great stories that you remember him for, as Charles spoke about. You know that uh, when, when Goliath looked at him and said, "Am I a dog that you would bring such a young boy how to destroy me with with one act of faith and obedience?" He defeated the army of the Philistine army because once Goliath was took out, that was the army feared to death. You know, great times, at great times with, with, within his life, but we read about this great man who slayed the giant that day on the rooftop of his house, being in a place where he shouldn't be. Now, there was nothing wrong with the rooftop. It was what the rooftop allowed him to see. Then he started to, at this point, he should have been busy in God's work. There was enough to do. The army was on the front lines, the army was on the battle line. His greatest of men were sacrificing their life for the work of God, but what does he do? He gets up on the rooftop and he starts to look at the woman near Sheba, and he starts to see a bathing. What does he do? I want her. I want this woman. And he takes the woman. And then, because of, because of the circumstances, what's, what's surrounding, what sin brings, you know the story. He then, you know, he fell into a greater sin. And there's not much greater sin than, than committing adultery. That's terrible. It's detestable in the sight of God. But then he became a liar. Then he became, uh, you know, a murderer. Then, he, then his life was on this downward spiral. And, it, you know, his life became in tatters because of the sin that he desired in our lives. Do you know today that sin desires to have you? You know, we have, we have these marking top experiences within our Christianity and the good. They are good and listen, I would advise you, if you're up on that mountain, right, and you're worshiping God and you're praising God and you're reading your word and you're walking with God, stay there, make it your aim to stay there. But in life, we see temptations come along. We see that the enemy is a thief, spoken about by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. So sin desires to argue, do you know that? And being lazy in the things of God opens a door within our heart, within our minds, where we can see things and we do things that God doesn't want us to do. David, within this point, I, 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 you know, you, we, we study a lot about David. I see him in the best spiritual condition that is throughout the most of the Bible, you see David in. 
because he has now brought himself down to nothing, classing himself as a humble sheep coming before the Lord who is his shepherd. And because of that, right, and, and we need to take application from this today. If you're the Lord of your life, if you are the Lord of your life, your Lord, your God, your shepherd, will never do the things in, in your life that he intends to do. You know that, don't you? We're all called by God to love him, to worship him, to walk with him, to serve him. Every one of us. You know, you see these people who say, oh, he's a good Christian, isn't he? He's a good Christian. He, he always does good. That Christian who you class as a good Christian is in the same battle as you are. The difference is, is through spending time with the shepherd, through having your heart and your mind and your full life devoted to him, devoted to the things that he wants for your life, there is more likely of a chance that you will do the things that God wants you to do. And it's simple. Look, he says, because the Lord is my shepherd, because Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Shepherd, it's such, to look at a shepherd, you can, you know, you've seen them, those who've been to Israel, you went to the place and you back to the enemy. You see how the shepherd looks after his sheep and certain ways of doing this and certain ways of doing that. When you break the word shepherd down, it, it, it should bless your heart and encourage you that to make, when you do make the Lord, the Lord complete with your life, that your life is in safe hands. The word shepherd, right? So he's saying the Lord is the one who tends to my needs. Very simple to understand. If you're a child of God, and you give your life to God, and you let him lead your life, he is the one who will tend to your needs. It says, and the word shepherd means, one who enjoys friendship. One who enjoys your company. Can, can our mind, our feeble mind, get around this today? The Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth, the creator of mankind, enjoys friendship with you. It's mind blowing, isn't it? That the Lord would enjoy your friendship. I like being around nice people, I really do, and you probably do as well. It's nice to be around nice people, and it's nice to be around people who encourage you, and it's nice to be about around people who talk about God. But do we really understand the company we are in when we're in the place where David is here? That the Lord is, is, his, is his companion, the one who feeds him. The shepherd looks after the sheep, and he feeds the sheep. This life that God has given you, you know, this new life, you are not sacrificing your old ways or your old ways of living in vain, you know that, don't you? Because the Lord wants to feed us with the best of the best. Jesus said, I come to give you life and life in abundance. And he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for, for his sheep. God knows your needs and that's what he says, this companion. He says, because he's my shepherd, I shall not be in want. How come, if we're called children of God, that we, at many times within our life, look like we're people who lack everything? You know, we, 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 we seem to want more of this, we seem to want more of this, we seem to want more of our own direction, when all the time the Lord wants to lead us in. Because we're his children, we will not be in want. Now, I'm not going to say to you today that the Lord is going to give you everything you want, as in what's beneficial for you in the flesh, your worldly desires, your worldly needs and greeds. But as a Christian, I have an assurance for you today. As a child of God, one who is following Jesus, he will give you everything you need. You see, many Christians don't say, I can't do it. It's physically impossible for me to be a Christian. You are right. It is physically impossible, but spiritually, God has made the way. God has made the way. He says, and because of him being our shepherd, we shall not be one. In verse 2, look what he says. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know what I love about this, this simple word? He doesn't force me to lie down in green pastures, does he? It doesn't say the Lord forced me, because if you use the word, someone makes you do something, that can be by force. But what, what David's saying here, right, is because of his, his desires have changed, he wants to be in the place where his shepherd is. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. The place where God wants him to be is the place where he now desires to be. And you know the reason why this, and, and you know, Charles brought something today that God's grace is our tutor. Because through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, when he becomes our teacher, right, that when we learn about his grace, how much it cost God for you to be saved, how much God gave up for you to be called a child of God. That's when you start to learn about how much you don't deserve God's grace. How much you don't deserve God's mercy. How much you were, you know, destined for hell, but because of his great love for us, even though we were dead in our sin, he made us alive in him. Now David is in that green pasture where there is new life, where there is new growth, where a, where a sheep can grow healthy and strong. He says, I, I can't help myself because of his great love for me. I can't help myself to want to do the things that God wants me to do. And I can't help myself being in the place where God wants me to be. Your mind today, and it's not about the seminar. This seminar is, thank God for it. And thank God it's another tool where we're able to preach God's word to God's people and people's lives being restored, lives being changed. It's not about a big buzz and a big atmosphere. But if you're a sheep belonging to the shepherd, you're in the right place today. Maybe your mind is, is probably before this message is preached, well, well, should I just nip off after this meeting? Maybe I don't like the pastor, I don't like the preacher who's preaching. Maybe you've got wind that it's Jackie Boy preaching. I've heard Jackie before. I've heard it all before. But it's not about what Jackie Boy has for you. It's not about what Butlin's has for you. It's about what God has for you. That's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why David was now desiring to be at the place where God wanted him to be. Green pastures is a place where there is new life. A place where there is where a, a, a sheep can grow healthy and strong. Jerusalem is, or, or Israel, a place where there's barren land, where there's very little green grazing. But David's now gazing upon God and he's looking and saying, Lord, this is the place where it's better for me. And you know, you, brothers, today, being around God's people, being around the Word of God, being around the Good Shepherd, let me tell you, you will become the healthier, healthier Christian that God wants you to be. When we hunger and feed upon God's Word, let me tell you, you will grow into the man, and you will grow into the, the young boy who's becoming men, into the men that God wants you to be. You will grow healthy and strong You know. You read the Word of God, as much as it hurts, you apply it to your life, you grow as a Christian. You hear a sermon preached from a pulpit, whether it's in the seminar, whether it's your church back home, as much as sometimes it digs deep and pierces the heart, because God's Word does pierce our heart. God's Word is alive, God's Word is true. And you know when our heart is open, God's word will accomplish what it sets out to do. There's a portion of scripture in it. You know, God's word never goes void. Rightly so. God's word will always, always accomplish. But sometimes we're drifting away and out of the place where God wants us to be so that the word has no effect on our lives. Look what he says. He says, he leads me beside quiet waters. He leads me beside quiet waters. You know, most of you will have heard about Bible studies about sheep being little timid animals. That if you if you send a, a sheep or if a sheep goes slightly astray and it goes where rushing water is, it doesn't feel no security. It's timid. It's it's nervous. It's frightened. It doesn't want to be where there's rushing water. The still water is where a, a sheep will feel a comfort and a peace and a secure. Why? Because the shepherd is looking over the sheep in the green pasture beside the quiet waters. You know the, the rushing water, the, the fast currents, can be a picture of the world, of the darkness of the world. And you, I don't have to be a theologian or a rocket scientist today to tell you that this world is getting darker and darker. Our people are, are going beyond limits now. Your friends at home who turned the clock back 20 years ago when you, when you said that I would never be a drug dealer, your friend at the side of you would have said the same. Or your, your, your 20 year you said, I, I would never have an affair, I would never do this, I would never do it. Your friend at the side of you would have said the same. 
But today, it's clever if we're doing them things. It's clever if our so-called friends are doing that sort of thing. So you are safe back. Now, isn't it funny, right, that we don't get, as before we're saved or in the flesh, we don't get nervous at many things. We will stand our ground with the strongest, strongest minded people in the world. Nobody will change my mind. I wouldn't back down for such a person. No way would I become timid or would I become weak. But we go and dabble in the world. We go into the darkness. We go into the places where God doesn't want us to be. Now, I'm not saying that you're going dabbling in sin. To go and do, to not do the things of God, you don't have to be dabbling in sin. But we become nervous and timid. No, if I get too close. I remember, I might have shared this before, I, I remember being at one of these seminars and, and it's probably in here now, one of our brothers from back home and, and he hadn't gone being saved and we'd been praying for his uncle. His uncle had been locked up in France for months and months and we'd been praying for him to get out. His uncle got out and, he, and he'd come to a seminar. He'd lost five stone, he looked like death warmed up. And we'd been praying for his uncle to get out of prison and his uncle come to his nephew and put his arm around him and he said, be careful. Be careful of spending too much time with these Christians, he said. Be careful of getting too involved in this Christianity, he said. Because you won't, won't have a shovel about you, you'll never have a shovel about you. Thank God, my brother's here today and he never took no notice. But you know his uncle who gave him that advice? He's chasing after the things of the world. Ten times more than what he was back then, 10 or 15 years ago. And you know, the things of the world should make us timid. As a child of God, they should frighten us. We should be running a mile from sin. And you know, because it's not where we start, it's where we finish. If our heart is not pining for the things of God, then sadly we start to pine for the things that God doesn't want us to have. And here we, we see David's heart and his mind start to pine upon the green pastures, upon the, the still waters. Jesus covers most of Psalms 23, you know, everything that Psalms 23 says, the Lord Jesus is in them. The Lord Jesus is our shepherd, he's the good shepherd who laid his life down for his sheep. The Bible, he says, I am the bread of heaven, doesn't he? I am the bread of heaven. He who, he who feeds on me, he who comes to me will never be hungry again. I am the living water. Remember what Jesus said to the woman, you know, at, at the well? I am the living water, he who drinks from me will never be thirsty again. Everything that we need is in Jesus. But a question I have to ask the Church of Jesus Christ today, where is our yearning for God? Where is our yearning for the living water? Where is our yearning for the bread of heaven? There's the very word of God himself. You know, the still water and the green pastures don't seem to satisfy us enough. We want them so much of the green pastures, we want so much of the still waters, that we want our percentage of often the things that God doesn't want us to have. You know, in God, the, the, the book of, uh, it's one of the epistles, I think it's in Timothy somewhere, and he, he says, stop being, stop being timid. Strengthen up. And as children of God, because the Lord is our shepherd, he who lives in you, is greater than any he is in the world. And God has a far better of a blessed life. We don't come to God, right, because we want to bless life. We come to God because we find out that we're sinners, we find out that we're destined for hell, but because of his great mercy for us, somehow, because of his, his infinite mercy, his beautiful wisdom, that God decides, because of his love for you to save you. Your salvation is not based upon you. It's based upon God, but in that life, when we get saved, there really is a life of abundance. And it's the place where God, look what he says, he says in verse 3, where he restores my soul. Verse 3. You know when we're in the place where God wants us to be, when we're feeding from God's word, when we're drinking from the well that never runs dry, there is restoration there. You know that, don't you? You know when you break this word down, right? It means to turn back, to be refreshed, to be restored. Exactly what true repentance means. You know within your heart today, there is things that God wants you to repent of. You know within your heart that God is wanting to make a change within your life. And you know what true repentance means? To say, Lord, I'm enough. I'm sorry of the way that I live. 
I'm sorry, Lord, that I am Lord of my life. I'm sick to death of me leading and making mistakes. But Lord, I want you to lead. That's what repentance means. It means to have a change of mind, a change of heart. And that's where restoration is. David, in his heart, you can see, he's starting to be restored, he's starting to be refreshed. He's starting to be renewed. Look what he says. It says, then, when we're restored, when we put our minds and our hearts focused upon God, he says, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths of righteousness can only be found in the life of Jesus. You can be the cleanest living man in this place, but the righteousness that God desires from you and desires from me cannot be found in your good works or your good deeds. It's a righteousness what can only come from Jehovah, who is the good shepherd. And he is our righteousness. And you know this, this righteousness, it says for his name's sake. Are we Christians today? Amen. Are you happy that you're a Christian? Amen. Are you, I don't mean pride, but are you proud to be a Christian? Amen. Are you happy that you're no longer a child of the devil who was on his way to hell? Well, the name Christian, it means someone who is a follower of Christ. It means someone who is Christ-like and does the things that Jesus Christ did. I, you know, Jesus in his word says, he leads my paths of righteousness here. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. So it's the ways of God that is best for you. It's living in the truth of God that is best for you. And it's living in the life of God that is best for you. So for his name's sake, if we're Christians, now never mind if you are, uh, you know, oh, I'm Pentecostal. Never mind if you're all Baptist. Never mind if you're a reformist. First and foremost is, are you a Christian? And if we're Christians then, do we live as Christ wants us to be? The Word of God says, it says in Philippians, it says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. Because he lives within you. Your mind and your heart has been transformed and renewed. So that you no longer want to do the things that you would like to do. We all want to be Christians when we die, don't we? We all want to go to heaven. We all want to be standing before an almighty God and say, Lord, I'm a Christian. What about starting to be Christians as we live? Imagine the impact that if every man in here... And we thank God that some men was having a great impact and I praise God for them. And I give God the glory for that. But imagine if we all started to live life like Christians, how much of an impact we would have. Do you realise how much you're valued by the shepherd? You know sheep, going back to physical sheep, they're not wild animals, you know. They're not, they're not wild by the, they're not owned by no one. A sheep is owned by a farmer. You see the stripes on them, don't you? And the shepherd looks after them. They have a value to the owner. Do you know how much of a value has been put upon your soul? Do you know how much of a value that is put upon your life? So much so that it costs the precious blood of Jesus for you to be able to be called a Christian. He gave you the right to be called a child of God. No longer in your own genealogy, but a child of God. We are bought and owned at a price. All the more we should be want to be in this place where David was. No longer on the rooftop, no longer in the palace, no longer at his work, but he, every opportunity he could to be gazing upon the very shepherd who start who saved his soul. Look what he says in verse 4, and I'll try and get through it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff they comfort me. The valley of the shadow of death. We get a picture of the world today as being the valley of the shadow of death. It isn't the point of death. But look what the world represents. You know, I remember being a young Christian, and I remember Jacob Frost coming to preach at our church. And he said, Christians spend time living with zombies. I looked and I looked, I must be honest, I thought this man's off his head. I'm, I, I don't spend time with zombies. I don't live with zombies. But you know when the word of God penetrated into me, I knew exactly what it meant. We spend more of our time with living and, and talking and doing things that the unsaved people do that we become like zombies. People can't tell if we're Christians or not. What type of Christianity is this for us? You know, 
And, and yes, there is some people in here today, and my heart does go out to you that you are in the valley of the shadow of death where you feel like there is no hope, where you feel like there is no future. Maybe back home, maybe a son or a daughter on drugs, or maybe your marriage is in turmoil. Maybe there is tragedy within your life, maybe in the depth of mourning. And in that, God is dealing, God is working. The Bible says that in the book of Romans, that God is working it all out for the good of those who love him. But as David probably is looking at these valleys, we've been there, the Kidron Valley, we've been to the other valley in, in Jericho, and maybe looking, you know, David's got a city named after him in Jerusalem, the city of David. But probably where he's escaped, running after the enemy, pursuing, pursuing him, in a cave in darkness, not in a place where God wanted him to be. If he'd never done the stupid the stupidity of, you know, living his life to please himself, he maybe would have never been in that cave. Charles said today, they all had a consequence of prayer. You know, but he looks now and says, never again. Never again within my life am I going to let myself in my own defense. Because he says, your rod and your staff, they are with me. They comfort me. You know, they protect me. As a child of God, you have got the greatest defender the world can ever have. The Bible says that he calls Jehovah as our banner, he's our victory, he's our defender. You look at today's, today's world, you know, and, and everybody who's got the best defense system, Russia, America, the bombs, Israel had the best defense system that money could buy. But it slipped up, didn't it? The, the enemy found a way through, the safety net. I want to tell you this today. If you really let the Lord be Jehovah of your life, you have the greatest defense. It's not fair. It would be unjust to call it a system. But your saviour can defend you from these kinds of trouble. You know about them. It's like you beat off the lion and the bear and, and Goliath and all of that. But he couldn't, he couldn't beat off sin. That has got to be a place where you humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I hate this life of sin. And Lord, Jesus teaches us how to pray on a daily basis. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from all evil. So in these dark valleys, I guarantee you there is many here today who are in dark valleys because your heart's desire is not upon the things of God. They are on the things of this world. They are on the things where you can be tomorrow. They are on the things where you can be on Saturday. They are on the things where God doesn't want you to have. When you humble yourself, look what it says in verse 5. It says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You know, you would agree with me today that the world is falling to pieces. You know, the, the, the governments, the schools, the police, all government bodies, they, they fell apart. They're not falling, they have fell apart. There is no morals no more. There is no standards. And our people are killing themselves, or if not killing themselves, they're killing one another. But God has drawn us out of this darkness into the light because Jesus said, I am the light. I am the light of the world. And he who follows me will come out of the darkness when we live in, the, in this light. He says that he prepares a table probably in the presence of my enemies. God wants to feed you with the best. He wants to feed you with food that will never run dry. He wants you to drink from the well that will never run dry, rather than spending time, right, rather than spending time with zombies. Start spending time with your shepherd. There's men in here, right, and I'm not judging. It's, it's the responsibility of the word of God through the anointing of God, the preacher, to spell these things out and open them up and I don't condemn. But there's men who don't pray in the morning time and go before their God and say, Lord, help me not to sin. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from all evil. Protect my life. When we start to do the things that God wants us to do, look what he says. In the presence of our enemies. The world is going to get worse, and you know that, don't you? Mark this, in the last days there will be terrible times. The worst is yet to come for the unsaved people. But you know, for the Christian, the best is yet to come. There's a little portion of scripture where I, I, I don't want to go off text today, but John 15, where it says, those who bear fruit, he prunes, so that they will become even more fruitful. That tells me, if you live in the life of Christ, the best is yet to come. 
a table in front of you, right? Of course, we have the we have the table of the Lord, the remembrance meal. We don't take it like we used to do in religion. But it's not just about the remembrance meal on a Sunday morning. It's about living a fruitful life for Jesus Christ. Look what he says. He says, "You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows." You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Now, David knows about the anointing, as it's often spoken about in the Bible, where the high priest would be the only one anointed with the pouring of the oil, or the king that would anoint him when he was made made into king. But this is a, a different word here. If you, if you can look at it yourself. You know what it actually means. It means to be fattened up, to be satisfied with the things of God. So when we become full of the things of God, we become less satisfied with the things of this world. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So I guess you know the anointing, what he's speaking about, about the pouring of the oil. Men say, oh, well that's all for the preachers. No, the anointing of God is where we spend time rubbing shoulder to shoulder with God. That's where the anointing comes from. But this is through feeding from God's word. Being hungry for the things of God. As I looked at this, this, you know, being full, being overfull in God is, is quite healthy, being overfull. If horsemen in here, I've got a picture with him in mind, it's only a world, world illustration, horsemen in here, right? If they're taking their horse to Appleby, for instance, or, or other horse fairs up and down the country, they will do their best to make sure that that horse has the, the best of feeding and that it's looked after. And they take it down there as fat as butter. Full, because it looks like it's come from an healthy, a healthy stable, uh, from, from, from a good breeding. God wants to fill up, up so much with this abundant life in him that everything else will become dissatisfactory to us. That's what it means. You anoint my head with oil so that my cup overflows. It was Stephen Smith, I remember him saying it many years ago. Many years ago, it stuck in my mind because it was a young Christian. He said, out the overflow of the heart comes out the mouth. Is your heart and your mind so full of the things of God that everything you want to talk about is wanting to bring glory to Him? Because as Christians, that is the attitude and that is the mind what Christ has for us. Now, being fat in God, that's what it means. It means to be fat. But I see so many undernourished Christians I saw, see so many people walking about, rather than like zombies, but like skeletons. That there is, not a, there is not a healthy part of the body in the Christianity. We've become very good at diet. We've become very good at, at losing weight. We've become very good at, you know, if you want to know about keto, go and see Jackie Boy. If you want to go about, know about calorie count, I could be your man. You know, and we've even, and I'm not condemning you, you know, there is a way of, of, of bypassing the stomach so that, you know, men need to have a healthy body, they're in bad health. I don't blame this. Good testimony, you know, you know, walking in health rather than falling off your feet, dying, I'm not, I'm not a problem with that. But we've found a way, instead of fasting for the world, we're fasting ourselves on the things of God. We're under, we're under, we're under nourished. And if I was, if I was wrong, if I was wrong, I wouldn't be able to speak the word of God today as it illuminates. Why is our people so undernourished? The simplicity of this, that every conversation out the mouth is where they can be tomorrow, where they can be next week, is because they are not satisfied with the portion that God wants to feed them. This is what he says when your cup is overflowing. And I'm going to close with this. Verse 6, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. It's not your goodness, it's not your love. Surely God's goodness and God's love will follow you all the days of your life. You got saved, you became a blessing, you became a child of God. For God to work with, for God to mold, for God to shape. And he, the good shepherd today, wants to take us all in his hands and mold us and shape us so that we're not thinking about getting home. We're thinking about, Lord, when we do go home, 
how can we be effective for you? When our lives are full of God's love, right? When our life is so, so full of God's goodness, we stop then thinking about our own goodness and have our own love. Because even the ones who say they don't love themselves, remember I've got the same gene as you, we love ourselves. And in fact, so much, so much so, some of us are loving ourselves to death. Some of our people are loving themselves into hell. But I'll tell you where God's love kicks in. Worldly sin kicks in. Where God's love starts to demonstrate within our lives. When we start to love others above ourselves. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what John the Baptist did. That's, when, that's what the men who we take examples of, the Apostle Paul, he hated the man he was. But he started to love others. You know when, you know when the brothers are going out evangelizing, you're not doing them a favor. You know, let them build the church. Let them have the outreach as well. You, every man in this room, is called to outreach to others. Because you are so grateful for the God who saved you, you want to take his love out to others. Okay, you know discipleship now is far and few between. You ask somebody, who are you discipling? Say what you mean. What do you mean among my disciple? Jesus says, go and make disciples. Each one of us should have, should have our hearts compelled by the love of God. When we, when we sit in that green pasture, when we're feeding on the word of God, when we're, when we're so grateful to God that, Lord, I want to be effective in somebody else's life. And what he says with that, because of that, that goodness and love will follow me all the days of life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's mind here wasn't too interested on the tabernacle. You know where David wanted to be? In the place where God dwelt. In this life we live in, we are so blessed that God doesn't live in tabernacles no more or temples built by hands. Do you know where God lives? According to the Holy Bible. If you're a Christian, he lives in your heart. And David, the King David was prepared to push all of his stature aside. Say, Lord, from today, I want to live my life to follow you. Let's pray. While we're praying, I want you to know something. In your strength, in your flesh, you haven't got the ability to be the man that God wants you to be, Brother Jim. But because of him, the Lord, Jehovah, who is your shepherd, he will give you the ability. The question I ask for you today is, are you wanting to be the child of God, who God wants you to be? Or are you wanting to continue to live your life with you being the Lord of your life?